Good morning. I hope you are doing well and safe. And we want to proceed with chapter two and we will discuss today several topics, including information and task processing. So we start with this topic to see how cultures, they are different in processing information and concerning their intercultural uh, understanding. So we should understand that cultures, they deal with information in different ways. Some cultures, they consider words, spoken words, more than clues and cues. So perception of cues or signals in some cultures is acceptable in addition to the words, but they need more clarification in giving them certain signals to understand what you mean in certain situations. Moreover, how to obtain information and to process them. So there are different ways between cultures in obtaining the information and processing them. We differentiate between two types of context and cultures in dealing with information. Scholars, they differentiate between two things, the high context cultures and the low context cultures. Let us see what, what do we mean by high context cultures. These cultures, they do not depend on the explicit words alone, as I said. They need physical gestures and body language to communicate a message. So for this reason, you might find in, centers, in certain cultures that they say certain statements followed by certain body language in their hands or their eyes or their uh, some gestures in their body to show that or to support their argument and the words that they have said. In the low context cultures, people here, they depend more on words. This is the primary means of communication with other uh, people. So that you don't find them depending on giving gestures or explaining in body language what do they mean in the, their statements or in other situations. Okay, let us move to what do we mean by uh, monochronic versus polychronic cultures. In mono monochronic cultures, this means that these the people in these cultures, they uh, differ in the way they perform tasks. In monochronic cultures, usually uh, people, they prefer to work sequentially. What do you mean by sequentially or in order? This means that I would like to do one thing at a time. So I will finish this thing, then I will start doing the other thing. For example, if we are doing a transaction with one customer, we should finish the transaction with this customer, then we move to the other customer and serve him. On the other side, polychronic cultures, they can or they prefer to perform multiple tasks at the same time, and they are uh, efficient in doing this. They often feel more comfortable, work simultaneously on a variety of tasks, and dealing immediately with multiple customers at the same time who need their service. Another topic we should uh, arise or we should talk about is idealism versus pragmatism. What do you mean by idealistic cultures and pragmatist cultures? Here in idealistic cultures or principled cultures, from the word of principle, this means that these cultures, they are more comfortable when they set certain principles for moral judgment, for moral behavior. So they prefer to set these principles to govern their life, to govern their behavior, even though sometimes those principles, they might not be, they might not serve uh, the right approach that they are doing, but they prefer these principles to be set to feel more comfortable or to feel safe as long as they are there. So they establish these principles to tackle even the smallest uh, manners or the smallest problems they might face. On the other side, pragmatism, which means rational, rationality is the opposite of the idealistic cultures here. 
if the idealistic sometimes in these cultures, if the idealistic principles get on in the way, those pragmatists will do whatever is deemed as practical to with no concern for morality. So they move forward uh, despite that sometimes this action might not be in the best moral way or best moral principle. Communication. How people, they are different in their uh, getting together or communicating with each other in different societies and different cultures. So, when you cross the borders and do business with other countries or in other situations and other societies, you must uh, always translate what you want to uh, convey to people, what is your message that you want to tell people in a certain manner. So, usually, we depend on the spoken language in addition to written language. But in addition to spoken and written, there is something called silent language. What do you mean by silent language? Silent language is the non-verbal cues, which we send it intentionally or unintentionally, which here, sometimes it, it will cause misunderstanding because people, they might not understand what do you mean by the silent language or the cues that you have sent them in a certain manner. Under these items, we would consider how we are different based on color, distance, time and punctuality, body language, and prestige. Let us see what do you mean by each item of all these. Color, in certain cultures and certain countries, there are certain colors they are preferred than others. If we prefer black, to us this means something. If we prefer white, it means another thing. So, there is a big difference between uh, certain cultures. They think that black should reflect uh, something which is sad for the people. When you prefer white, this will reflect that you are happy because the white color reflects the uh, celebration of certain occasion and so on. Moreover, the distance distance for certain in uh, when we want to communicate with people in some cultures you are required to keep a distance with people when you talk to them don't get too close to people when you are uh, uh, communicating with them or you are telling them something this is not acceptable in certain cultures so uh, don't get too close to people and keep a distance away from them moreover time being punctual and respecting the time. So time respect is a must in certain cultures because people will judge you if you are punctual in your promises that you will arrive on a certain time and, and so on. Body language, body language, as I said, it reflects the cues and gestures that you give to people to support your words and your spoken language. Another thing which, re which reflect differences between cultures is how far we set on the status of the people. Some people, they think that it is a prestige manner if I would have more items which will show that my status in this society, such as for uh, an official, for instance, having a large office with nice furniture compared to other cultures where these, I, these things, they are not that much important, which will reflect that uh, he is more prestigious than other people or having better status than other people. How we deal with cultural differences? Okay. Host cultures. What do you mean by host cultures? Host cultures are the cultures where we are doing our business outside our country. So, usually, as a host culture, they expect that you will conform to their principles, to their norms and their values. In addition, you must understand their national culture and you must respect the local uh, behaviors and the local values of the people without antagonizing them in, an, uh, in irrespect of their values or irrespect to show that you don't respect their 
uh, behaviors in a certain manner and make fun about them. In order to respect other cultures and show that you respect other cultures, uh, international managers usually they should consider the host society acceptance, which means that the host country and people in this country, they accept those managers. How they will accept them? Because you will show your respect to them. So they will accept you as long as you show your respect to their behaviors, to their uh, values and their principles. Okay, the degree of cultural differences, which will show a cultural distance and how far I can uh, adjust in this culture uh, in a better way to serve my interest and the interest of my organization. So uh, this is what we call cul uh, uh, culture acculturation, which means that once you move to another society, which is a strange society to you, this means that at the beginning, uh, you will feel that you don't belong there because they have different values, different languages, and so on. So, at the beginning, you have a feeling of, you are as if you are being lost in this society. Then, you, you have a feeling of refusing to be, to act, or to behave in a certain manner, which equals their behavior. Then gradually, you will find that you are trying to understand their values, to understand their behavior, and to try to adapt to the situation that you are in. In the process of understanding others, on their term, others, they will also try to understand you and to show you the good side of their behavior and their uh, values uh, so that you can get together and to understand each other. Then you reach and you will not reach a point where we call it a culture shock, which is uh, the reverse, um, here it's explained in, uh, you will have culture shock once you adapt to a certain society for a long period of time, then we ask you to return to your, to your country, to your home country, then you will feel a culture shock because you came back to where you have been there at the beginning and so, then you will try again to adapt yourself to the new situation and the new society. Uh, that you will live in. Here, there should be something called manager orientation. You should train the managers about other cultures and other values that they, they will expect to face in other settings and in other societies. How we deal with cultural differences? Usually, the international manager, uh, when he go to work in other countries, he should consider, or he might consider, to adopt one of three approaches in, in the company. The first one is called polycentric, the other one ethnocentric, the, other, the third one is the, is the geocentric. What do we mean by each one? Okay, let us explain here in detail what do we mean by polycentrism. Here, Polycentrism, which means that uh, in our operation, uh, we, we are having uh, to um, uh, a degree of autonomy so that we will uh, consider that the uh, country culture that we will be working in is the uh, culture that we will be adopting in our operations in this country. So we reflect respect to this, to this culture and we are considering this culture as the norm that we should follow. Ethnocentrism is the opposite, which means that my home country culture is superior to the culture that I will be working in. So you will consider that whatever comes from your country is better than whatever you will be living in in this society. The third approach is the geocentric, geocentrism which means that mixing the first and the second, mixing polycentric and the ethnocentric together, there is no one better than the other, which means that being geocentric, I will take into consideration that the host country culture is good and my country culture is as well good 
and I will adopt both in my operations so that I will show respect to the host culture. In addition, I will not forget my home culture as a, a, a mechanism which I should rely on whenever I need in my work internationally. Okay, so if we agree that people should change or people should consider change according to the situation that they will be operating in, what do we expect in the process of globalization, in the process of getting people to know each other in order to make uh, the economy or the global economy in a better situation in an easy way to perform your international business in other countries and so on. So what strategies we should follow? Here we set certain strategies which are based on value system, cost benefit analysis of change, resistance to change, participation, reward sharing, opinion leadership, timing and learning abroad. Let us see what do we mean by change that are based on these strategies. First of all, what about the value system? We said that each country, each culture is proud of their value system. So don't try to force change on these values as if you are saying to them that you are inferior than my uh, values because I am getting to you, I'm bringing to you a new value system which is more or superior than yours. So, if we want to promote change in the value system of people, we must make sure that this will take a long time. What kind of value system you will need to change? Sometimes you need to see what negative approaches to things or to business that is uh, prevailing in this society and try to alter the approach of doing this thing in a way that people will not feel harmed that you are trying to change their core value system. So be careful in imposing a change on the value system which is the core value of the people. Moreover, if you want to change, usually this will cost a lot and you need a budget to launch change. So you must make a cost analysis cost-benefit analysis of change. Does change really worth it to be launched or should I postpone it or follow other strategy that will solve the problems for me? Bearing in mind that launching change, usually you should be prepared that people will resist the change. So cost-benefit will give you the answer. Does it worth it? to launch that change as long as people will resist that change and resistance to change, it will take a long time to convince people of accepting the change as you want it to happen. It's very important to involve other parties in the change process. Who are the other parties? We spoke earlier about stakeholders. Stakeholders, they are the people inside the organization who are the employees and outside the organization. They are the society at large, including customers, including government parties, including uh, communities, and so on. So everybody should understand the reason for the change, the benefits of change, in order for them to support you in a, 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 a productive manner. You can seek the help of uh, opinion leaders in the uh, society. Those are who are the influencers who can influence other people and convince them that the change that will be launched, it will be for their better life. It will cause or it will bring better results for them. For this reason, change is uh, inevitable and you should accept this change as long as it will serve you in a better way. Timing. When change is acceptable, you should choose the right time to launch the change. Don't choose the wrong time to launch the change because you will know that it will be a failure. Learning abroad from other companies' experience will help you in launching the change. Get the uh, benefit of their experiences in how they did it. So if they did it the right way, then imitate their way. There is no harm in imitating and following others' experience because this will lessen your cost this will make your uh, objectives 
uh, to reach your objectives in an easier manner. So we have finished chapter two, and next week, inshallah, we will start with chapter three, talking about ethics and social responsibility. So we have come to an end, and I hope that you will be safe, secured, stay home, and see you next week, inshallah. Bye-bye.